Hi, y'all. This is Liz today with Smart Business Moves, and I'm here with Matt Ricketts. Doesn't that sound weird? <laughs> it's always Tom. Tom's always here, and he's introducing us. So, hey, Matt, I'm so glad you were able to come today and help me out here. Let me let me see if I can figure out how to get some of my comments and stuff up. That's not it. All right, we'll we'll see if I see everything as it, it comes in. You remember, Matt, over on the right hand side, you can see your comments. Oh yeah, I can That's see you. it. You see it? Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh Matt, we talked to you guys yesterday. Hey Leslie. Uh we talked to y'all yesterday that Matt was gonna come on here today and talk about some unique perspectives about how he's managing money. Y'all know that Matt is well known for managing his money well. And so he's going to bring us some fresh perspectives about, I think, PPP, Matt, and then also earned income tax credit, right? Sure. We can talk about that a little bit. And, um, you know, we can even talk a little bit about, you know, some of the, some of the strategies that I think about as far as, as income, you know, I would almost say, I don't want to say like what I, what I consider my living income, but um, I basically believe I, I can live on 40% of what I pay myself and the rest goes into savings. We can talk a little bit about that and about, you know, being able to carry forward uh, some of these strategies so that, that you can weather good times and bad and, and um, not get too ahead of yourselves. Cause I, I feel like early on in business, oftentimes when we would start making more money, I would start and I'd make the same mistakes everyone would. I'd be like, ah, I'm going to start spending more money. Right. Um, so, you know, those are some strategies with, with all this money that, that might be available to us now. It can be um, it can be a little bit confusing as to what to do with it, what to, you know, how to spend it and, and some things. So uh, not that I'm going to tell you how to spend your money, but I'll talk a little bit about what we do and how we how we kind of are are thinking through, um, you know, how this is some of this money is going to be potentially um you know a big boost and how we can potentially not overspend it and and make any big mistakes with with all this money coming in well and i think you're making a good point too that when you get a chunk of money like this it can be seductive you can feel like wow i've got all this money i can spend it on whatever i want i mean it's a big joke right about going out and buying a sports car sure. but people are actually doing things like moving their money around and and making some big purchases and the government is kind of pushing people in that way too, right? Got to keep the economy going. And you know, that's why we're putting this money out there. So people are feeling a little bit like, ah, it's, I'm, I'm not helping by spending all this money. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, you know, I, 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 hope yeah, everyone, I hope everyone by now has um, determined whether they qualify for, um, for PPP. Uh, and so, um, you know, applications are kind of on a little bit of a hold right now. I guess if it, I can't remember if it was uh, for companies with 20 employees or less. So some of the people watching today might might kind of fall into this window where where we're kind of in an exclusive application period uh, for for smaller businesses. Um, so, um, but the whole the whole thing ends at the end of the month, right? So you, if you, we had some people yesterday that hadn't applied yet, and they were a little bit bigger. Yeah. Um, March 31st is the end of the first quarter is the application to apply for, for the second round of PPP. So, it, you know, 90 day window here to, to do it. They may extend it. There's a lot of money left over right now. So um, they may extend that out. Um, I wouldn't anticipate a third round, though. I think this is probably. Yeah. This so, is Matt, what are your thoughts for the. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. What were you saying? This is, is probably it, what? This is this probably is the last it. one. Take advantage of this if you can. And then we can talk about ERC in a little bit too about you know how that is coming into play. Well, I, I well I'd like to hear your perspective for uh, the people that are thinking, well, I don't really need the money right now. Yes, I qualify, but I don't need it. So uh, they're talking about maybe not taking the money. What what are your thoughts there? I would I would take it. I would bonus your employees significantly. I just gave out, you know, 30,000 in bonuses to my employees based on longevity and performance. Uh, I know uh, some other friends that gave out bigger bonuses that than that, almost 45,000 in bonuses out of their PPP money. So like 25, they took 20 to 25% of it and said, 
I'm going to use this towards, you know, retaining key employees. And you never know if that is going to pay off or not, but yeah. it's, it's an investment in your people and, and saying thank you for this has been a tough year for them too. I mean, you know, they've weathered some, you know, some, some challenges. So that's one way you could take the money and really think about rewarding some of your people. You could think about raising your base pay to be more competitive and, and using that money to strategically allow you to make a couple of price increases before you can really, you know, jump up and afford what you're going to pay people. I think, um, I think we're going to have to be closer to 15 or $16 an hour on pay nationwide. If you're in larger cities before, um, before much longer, even without increases in minimum wage, you're seeing Costco raising its base pay to $16 an hour. Um, Amazon oftentimes follows that. So, so you're going to, you know, you're not just going to end up pocketing this money. You're going to use it to, to make some strategic moves, right? Some smart business moves to, to put you in a position to get better employees probably so that you're worth more money in the marketplace. Um, that that's, those are things that I'm doing right now. So I'm getting ready to do a 5% price increase uh, to all my clients. And I'm already fairly price, you know, priced well. Yeah. But I've, I've identified 329 clients that are probably eligible and due for price increases out of our out of our client lists. And, and so we're going to go through those and and look at, you know, data, real real data that we've pulled from Made Central of of how many hours we're spending there. Are we on target? Are we are we over target if we don't need to bill them anymore because we're consistently, you know, uh, you know, charging them more than we're actually spending in their home. Um, I'm not going to go down on their price if they're happy, but I'm yeah. going to uh, I'm going to hold the line for them a little bit longer and, and not uh, do a price increase. Or if I do one, I would just maybe do it for like one percent, maybe just something just to let them know right. that there's something, maybe a dollar. Or do it. Right. Just to just to put something. I, are you. Are you using the new normalizing functionality? Because I, 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 would, have to, I would have to get a, a refresher code on what that all means. I've uh, I read a post about it, and I've forgotten since what normalized you know normalized average hours mean. Um, so I don't remember. Yeah. I'm sorry. I guess it's kind oh, of. That's okay. I was just curious. I, I think the normalized average hours is like if you had like your average employees on that property. Um, yeah. So Maid Central has this really cool feature where you can basically um, pick out a time period, like anyone that hasn't had a price increase in a certain amount of time. So like 12 months, um, anyone uh, that lives in certain areas, you, you can you can break it out all these different ways by by zones, by um, how frequently they're they're clean. Let's say you don't want to raise your weekly prices, uh, but you want to raise all your your monthly prices. Like let's say you're just like you know what monthlies are under bid in general, so you could just you can sort of like that. But there's what Liz was mentioning was there's this thing called normalized uh, average hourly. Yeah. So if you have an employee that's really fast on that house, that's like that is consistently um, under budget, but still, you know, does a good job. Well, it it actually tells you, hey, this employee does it, does it at one point eight hours. But realistically, an average your average employee taking out all the data, of all your employees, how long they take would take 2.25 hours. So it's it's bid properly, it's not under bid. It's a pretty cool feature. Now you, you kind of reminded me of what it all meant, but um, yeah, yeah, I have- No, that was, that was a really good recap, Matt. That was super fast and super easy. I, I like what you said because it just is saying your your average employee would really take this amount of time. So it's probably not under bid. And right. I really think that's valuable because so many times you get those employees that are really fast and you guys all know, Leslie, I know you, you've been in business forever. I'm guaranteeing you have some employees that are like that. They're super fast, do a really good job, always have really good scorecards, but you don't really want to be thinking that that's the average amount of time that it's going to take to clean that house because eh, just this vast scale over here does it that, that way. Yeah. All right. It's a cool feature. So um, I do too. But yeah, looking at all that data, we're looking at all that and looking at strategically raising the prices by about 10%. So uh, we need to get our prices from about $50 an hour to about $55 an hour. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no worries. We need to get it. Yeah, it rings on my computer sometimes when I don't pick it up on my phone. Um, so we need to get our prices from about 50 to, to about $55 an hour. But one way that we did this right away was we raised because we're just so booked 
Um, we raised deep clean prices from fifty dollars to sixty five dollars for all like oh, wow you know, for That's all one time, for all one time work. If they're just booking us for a one time cleaning, we're charging them sixty five dollars now. Okay. And that way, our technicians are making because because we do a fee split are making way split more. split is percentage, right? Percentage. For those not in the main central world. Yeah. It's percentage pay. So 24. So 37% of, of that goes to the technicians or 38%, I'm sorry, goes to the technicians under our system. So that's about $24 per hour uh, for a technician you know, of cleaning, you know, cleaning time on deep clean. So now uh, instead of making like 1850 on regular homes while they're cleaning or $19 an hour, uh, they can make almost 25. Well, they're actually happy to do deep cleans because there's a little bit of a differential or charging a little bit more. Um, and so a lot more. We, will, we will discount uh, deep cleans if they sign up for weekly or alternating weekly service, but not monthly. So if so, okay. so if like somebody signs up for monthly service, Ooh. they want a deep clean, they're paying the rack rate of $65 an hour, but we'll discount, we'll discount uh, 20% off that to get it closer to $50 an hour. And then we'll just eat that by paying the employees more on the deep cleans, at, like as if they're getting paid okay. $5 an hour. Um, the six five. But yeah. So we, we just take so you're that. Kind of, you're kind of two birds with one stone there because yeah. your employees are getting charged more. You're also controlling the amount of work you're having, keeping space available for your recurring cleans versus yeah. just piling on all the single work for your for your schedule, ah, sounds like when I never ever would have thought though to raise from fifty to sixty-five. That's big. So yeah, yeah. I, I wrote that down. <laughs> we thought about going to eighty, but we didn't think that that would that we thought that would price us out of the market a little bit. But I mean, at sixty-five, um, I'd have to pull up my numbers, but um, I looked at how many recurring sales we've had. Um, so. Uh, you know, some of you guys use point systems. I know Derek, uh, if you, you know, Derek created the system where a weekly counts for four points or this, you know, yeah. bi weekly is two points, whatever. Uh, we've had, we've had basically the equivalent of 19 weekly jobs added since the beginning of February, which would be what, like 36 points or something like, no, uh, wow. no, no, it would be like almost 80 points, 76 Wait, points. 19 weekly? Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. Not, we, didn't get, we haven't got 19 weeklies, but the way that made sense is, right. It, Gives they break you, down by week. Yeah, how many how many jobs a week? And you think about that, that's two employees we've needed to hire basically. So we, you know, for every I like thinking of it as in terms of jobs per week that we've added because you know, 10 jobs per week tells me I need to hire one employee or, or you know, be planning on hiring one employee. Um, or else I realize that my availability of one-time cleans is going to continue to shrink. So right. um you know, we're booking at least two weeks out, um, even with that sixty-five dollar an hour. So a lot of things uh, are a lot of things are, are working for us in the sense that consumers have become more patient during this pandemic in in waiting for things. Um, I ordered a garage door six months ago, and I haven't gotten it yet. And I'm just I'm going waiting on a freezer. What? I'm waiting on a freezer right now. <laughs> like I still don't have it. Hey, well, we got a couple of questions here, Matt. So yeah. uh, then Denise has a question. PayPal submitted her. Um, she submitted their app to the SBA 10 days ago and hasn't heard anything. Do you think she should hit them up again or don't worry about it? Or what do you think? I would, if there's a process to, to inquire where it is in the status, I don't think it would hurt to find out, you know, if, if it's been submitted to the, to submitted to the SBA and then, um, you know, then the SBA would, the, the steps would be that your bank would get it, they'd approve it, then they would, then they would submit it to the SBA the SBA would then review it and then approve it or deny it. Um, so I guess, you know, if they've submitted it and you haven't got anything back, it's not a bad thing. It just could be the SBA is backed up. Um, I mean, as long my, as you saw that it was submitted. You said that it was submitted to the SBA. Uh, yeah. Yeah. As long as you're sure that it was submitted, you saw something PayPal, you know, that you got something, you weren't just assuming that. So it's, beyond, it's probably beyond PayPal's control at this point. Um, and they're probably just, doing, you know, SBA is just doing their due diligence. They're, you know, they're doing their thing, but um, mine was turned around fairly quickly from the point we, we submitted to the SBA. I mean, I think it was like three days. So I mean, was fast. it was very fast, but I would, I would not, you know, worry too much, but you could, you could inquire with, with them if you haven't heard anything by Friday, I would, I would hope that it would be, um, I hope it would be pretty quick. 
Um, and Denise also in this two week window where they might have gotten a big influx, Denise, yeah. because they had, you know, they opened up this window specifically for uh, your size company. So maybe maybe that's it. But uh, I love Matt's advice. We haven't heard something by Friday. Maybe just double check. Check in. And, then and Denise has a. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Matt. As far as pricing recurring cleans, Denise, um, I mean, we use we use kind of the made central formulas and you know basically it 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 tells us you know how many minutes each room is going to take on you know for deep cleaning we we've kind of based that on our experience and um and, and based it on that but basically i i think that we consider a deep clean roughly 2.5 times uh, a maintenance clean is kind of our is kind of our rule of thumb but instead, and then again, instead of charging our rack rate of fifty dollars an hour, uh, we charge sixty-five per hour. So again, about two point five times. I think anywhere from two to two point five is going to win you business if you if you you know double to two and a half times your 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 recurring price on your deep cleans. Some people, um, and I know, successfully sell them at four times uh, yeah. their recurring clean prices, and um, I I think that that that's a strategy that, that works for some people, but I want to make my deep clean something that is useful and, and, and helps their house get ready, but I also not price this out of, of, of winning that business regularly. We just set expectations that of what, what's going to happen usually. And, and, and um, that works pretty well for us. And we're, and we're rarely have any problems um, that, you know, that we can't solve. And if we do, um, I'm usually willing to let it go because it's just such a small percentage of, of the overall, the overall business. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. It kind of depends on whether or not you're winning them. Uh, I know that Carrie Knight's strategy is not to charge anything. She doesn't charge anything for those initials. She just charges the same recurring fee. And then she sort of rotates through all of the rooms to get everything deep cleaned over time yeah. uh, because she wants to win every single biweekly. She doesn't want to let even one of them go. So kind of depends on what your strategy is there, maybe how booked you are. Yeah, my, my thoughts are, are on this, is, is that we allow people to come on without deep cleans and we will promise to catch up what we can over time, but we don't charge for that. But it's not like they're gonna get like, it's their house is not gonna be magically deep clean. It's gonna right. take, you know, maybe three, four or five months nice. before we, you know, get the house where we would want it. And sometimes really never, and they're okay with that. They just, you know, they're just, they're very conscious of price and they it, it's very helpful for us to come in and do what we can. And they don't need a perfect house. Their house wasn't perfect to start with. They're not expecting like, you know, lick the clean floors, you know, for, for what they're yeah. for. Um, it, You know, it really depends on the psychology of the, of the customer. If you can really tell that they have really high expectations, you're going to really want to start them with, with that deep clean. If it's a busy yeah. family with three kids and a dog, four kids and a dog, they're going to they're gonna probably be actually more just like happy to have the help. Um, so I, th I think it's some psychology of the, the customer. But um, what, we, what we always do is we allow them to book just recurring service. We, we, we recommend the deep clean and we sell probably half of our new customers on getting a deep clean to start with, but it's not required. And it, it works for us to go that, that nice. direction. It, it's just psychology of it. Yeah. I, um, my favorite line for, for this is to say, um, yeah, absolutely. We don't require it, but if you're wanting to come home on that first day and get the big wow, then you're going to want to pay for the deep clean. Otherwise, you're going to come home and yeah, your house is going to be clean, but you're not going to get that feeling of, oh, wow, this is so awesome. And 95% of the time, they're like, eh, yeah, I want that. I want the big wow. All right. Well, the big wow is going to cost you this much money. And people yeah, really where are you at? Do you think you're two and a half to four times somewhere? Two in and a half. Well, and ours half. is exactly, yeah, two and a half. We go up to three, but I, we never hit the four. We, I mean, I'm not going to say never. Uh, if some place is, you know, completely trashed and an older place hasn't been cleaned in years, yeah, you got a master shower that hasn't been cleaned in two yeah two years. Yeah, it might it might take that long. But yeah, I, can, I can think of two companies off the top of my head that I know have very effectively they won't start people without a deep clean, and they're like at like four x and they're they're selling them. Although I, I think their base pricing is lower, I think their hourly pricing. Is in like the thirty-eight to forty dollars. Oh well, that makes total sense then. Yeah, so I think that their their markets are are smaller markets where there's a little bit more competition on price on hourly rate, 
Um, so that that kind of comes into play a little bit too. So there's there's so many factors that kind of go into how that yeah. works. Well, and Robin is saying that she's charging 75. And Robin, I think you're probably talking about 75 for your singles or your one-time cleans there. Yeah. And for anybody that's wondering on here, especially smaller companies, I'm I'm guessing that Robin is talking about $75 per labor hour per maid hour. So you yeah. got two people in the house for one hour, that's $150. So a lot of times there's still some confusion around that. Yeah. So like for us, uh, yeah, we won't go into yeah. a house for less than 260 now. Like, so our minimum to, to even show up for, you know, to do a deep for a one-time job is 260 bucks. Like we won't even, wow. it's not even really worth it because um, there's just so much demand and we would just be turning, we would just be missing other opportunities. At this yeah. point. So I, I like that. So, you Me know, uh, you know, whatever you, whatever you can, can do in the market bears. Um, I, I think that, you know, we, we thought that there was just going to be this blood of employees that was going to be, you know, raining. Know. Down. Talk about being wrong about something, right? Oh yeah, my that, God. That was like, that prediction was, that prediction was way off. I mean, that was my initial thoughts. I was thinking in 2008, I never had a better staff, you know? Yeah. Um, us too. I was so excited about it, but who could have guessed that they were going to be giving out $600 a week. And then who would have guessed that they were going to extend it through, you know, forever and a day. I was going to say one of the things that we do is we charge um, a premium $75 an hour for next day. So if you want like service tomorrow, it's going to be $75 an hour. But if you can put it off for a few days and, and I don't mind rolling a job, from like tomorrow is booked, but if you're going to pay me $75 an hour, yeah, I'll roll one of my $55 an hour jobs <laughs> to the next day and, and yeah, get you clean. It's, it's flexible and you could give them a little bonus, you know, like, yeah. a, you know, an extra and people love to get the money, the extra money. They're like, woo, yeah. which I think we all know that those deep claims a lot of times are harder and they're not as fun to do maybe. So, yeah, I, th I think that's a good strategy. I think I, you know, it comes to mind of something me and Tom talk a lot about of like trying to solve with software, but some of this, some of these things are just things you can solve with SOPs, right? Like by yeah. having, by having, you know, all right, well, when this comes up, do this. Um, so these are things that like me and Tom have been talking about with software is like, all right, somebody wants to book next day and they want, you know, first thing in the day, well, the software should, you know, add some 20% multiple for that if there's, if there's an availability. Um, because chances are somebody that wants next day um, will, pay it. will pay it and probably will be a pain in the butt in other ways too. So you're taking on more risk. Um, you need to, you need to average out that risk a little bit, um, you know, by, by charging more. Think about going to the airport and buying a ticket same day. What do they charge you? It's yeah. astronomical, right? It, it's, not, it's crazy. Yeah. It's, you're paying big money. The, the booked out six months ago, that's flexible, that, you know, that the, the guy that walks up that day and wants to buy a ticket somewhere, uh, that, that guy's paying 50 to 100 percent more than than everyone else on that plane. So that's just the way that's the way dynamic pricing works in the airlines. They've been doing it for years. Um, I would love to solve that issue with software, but you can certainly start solving it with just SOPs by like what Liz is talking about, a, a standard operating procedures of, of hey, we're going to charge more for this. So. Um, but this all kind of circles back to what to do with strategy wise, what to do with your, with your PPP money. I think, yeah. you know, I think investing in your people, um, you know, making some, making some investments in them to, to try and a retain and attract better people. And then in part of that strategy is, is raising your prices and I, and not, and not being scared to do so at this time, because, um, all of us are booking out two, three weeks. I, I mean, if your booking slow down a little bit because you're a little high, then you might dial it back 10% or something like that. But um, you can you can experiment a little bit right now and try some new things with pricing. And you might be surprised that that people are, are willing to pay it because, um, I mean, I've gotten a couple calls in the last week of people wanting to go out of business and me to buy their book of business. And we're adding so many customers right now. I mean, we added so, so far this month, I'll have to, I think I have the spreadsheet open. Well, um, didn't you just say like 39 weekly? 39, over the two months, 39 weekly spots have been filled. Uh, so far this month to date, we've sold 21 new recurring customers. Last month, like like total recurring customers in the last um, the last month's over 60 recurring customers, basically, I think is what we're, 
is what we're looking at at this point. Wow, that's a lot. Where are you getting them, Matt? What, uh, what are your lead sources? A lot of, a lot of Facebook marketing. I still use an ad agency for that. Um, a lot of, um, a lot of AdWords still, um, that's still, you know, doing well for us. Um, you know, probably our top, top sources are our Facebook, um, you know, our long-term SEO strategy, um, which right now is mostly, um, you know, trying to maintain position um, through, you know, just getting more reviews, directory listings, um, but, but more people are becoming competitive. So we're going to probably start spending some money on that again. And, uh, you know, AdWords. Well, everybody out. doesn't have employees. That's the thing that nobody has employees. So the reason why we can win jobs is other places are putting them on a wait list, the two, we're, three week wait list. So we're telling them that they can't take new customers at all. I mean, um, that's, I, I'm yeah. hearing that quite a bit, um, but they're just not even, I mean, they would be smart to be taking wait lists, but they're not even, they're just like, we're booked. We're not, we have and no do it. We don't have any room. Yeah. Uh, Robin is saying also, okay, yep, yeah, uh, it's taking more time than the first round. I, I have heard that from a few different people and asking for more information. So, yeah, don't be surprised, Denise. And Carol is saying, wow, uh, 50 of our clients, not one person responded negatively. Usually a few try to negotiate. And I, I don't mind the negotiations either, but, yeah, a lot of people are finding that there's nothing. People are just like, oh, okay. And they're understanding, especially if you reference the, you know, the additional um, um, PPE, then people are like, oh, I get it. My dentist charges an additional $10 every visit for additional PPE, which really doesn't make sense to me because my dentist was already wearing masks. <laughs> they were already wearing gloves. They were already doing all of these things. So uh, but I talked to I, I talked to my dentist and she says now they change their masks in between each uh, client where before they would wear the same mask all day long. They change uniforms twice a day, which is like, wow. All right. And just because they're touching people and they're in everybody's space. So I was like, OK, that makes makes sense. But initially I was like, ah, what? Ten dollars. I, I think. Um... I think if you really add up what all the extra costs are that we've incurred, it's probably three or four dollars a clean. You know that you really, you really have to think about that, and that all yeah. kind of goes into your bottom line eventually. Um, you know, you know, it's not about it's not about greed. It's about long term survivability yeah. and long term. You know, long term basically having good financial. You know, uh, good financial uh, fundamentals. Of business. Yeah. So I don't yeah. think. I don't think raising prices. So normally I'd go 3%. We're going to do 5% now and probably 5% again um, towards the end of the year, which will be effectively an 11% price increase in one year. Um, you know, it's, we might do 5% and 4% later. So it's like an effective 10%, but either way um, it's, it's significant this year. We're, we're planning it in two stages. We did 4%. Uh, so we do them every month. So we've been doing 4% and we're talking about raising it now to 5%. So same thing, get an effective 10% there. Um, Robin, she doesn't want to change subject. We'll come back to money. Don't worry, Robin, <laughs> you can change subject. Uh, anybody staff getting vaccines yet? I have had two staff get vaccines, but we can get them. Um, our, ours opened up a, a little bit easier than some states I know. Um, some states are having an easier time, but uh, I know like in Colorado, they're still in, I want to say phase one, maybe to two, but you have to have two criteria um, to be able to get uh, on the list right now in Colorado. Yeah. Here, it's kind of easy. It's moving a little faster. I've had a few employees, but I, I don't find one. I wouldn't, I, I don't have, I don't have any kind of, um, policy that's encouraging it or anything at this time. I feel like um, more and more people are becoming receptive to it. I don't feel like it's not, I don't think it's anything that's going to need to be uh, pushed. If people want to get it, they'll get it. Um, the numbers are, the numbers are definitely trending the right way. Oh yeah. You know, we're seeing, you know, um, I feel like, you know, you could create a whole consumer index of, of uh, you know, 
what, what's the the consumer confidence index, right? You can create one just based on how much they're they're spending on getting their house clean and how many new customers are getting. So that that if there was a consumer you know confidence index based on that, I would say that's moving in the right direction. For sure. Um, vaccinations. Um, I feel like if you look at the statistics, the vaccine hesitancy is down to like probably 30, 40 percent. And there's probably 25 percent of people that are never going to get it. Um, they're just going to take their chances. And so mm-hmm. we're going to we're going to get to herd, immu- herd immunity one way or another, whether it's through enough people getting this or enough people getting the vaccine. Um, and I, I feel like we're probably at about 50 percent now. And that's why you're, you're seeing so the, the, the trends moving in the right directions. The vaccine really accelerated, um, you know, about, I, I think it's about 18% of people have had at least one shot now. Uh, on top wow. of probably 30% of people have already had COVID. So you're pretty, you're probably pushing, you're probably pushing 50% of the population has uh, some, some antibodies of some type of immunization. Cell immunity or antibody immunity of some kind. Yeah. So you're, you're talking yeah. about, um, you're talking about the, the disease is going to continue to decline. Um, so I'm again, long answer here, but the, the short answer would be, um, I am seeing some employees doing it. I'm going to continue to message that, that I think it's important that they do, um, you know, that, that they, that, that, that they're doing their part to help protect mm-hmm. others. And that, you know, even if they're young and healthy, it is an important step in getting our lives back to normal. And, you know, I think just messaging that out to your, to your employees um, being willing to get it yourself. If you're, if you're vaccine hesitant, um, I think that, that that's going to translate to your employees as well. I, I have that, that, uh, I don't think will get vaccinated, uh, anytime soon at least. So, you know, uh, one already had COVID, so she's probably not gonna, you know, be a, a spreader, but I have another one that I don't think will. And I, and again, I don't have any reason to, to push that down her throat, but it's, uh, um, it would be nice if she would, and I would hope she would set that example, but she's not gonna, uh, we've talked about not sharing any negative feelings about that with the staff. Well, look at Linda. Uh, she's saying that two thirds of her staff aren't planning on getting the vaccine. So that's a pretty big number there to plan on not getting the vaccine. That's, that's interesting. She's probably, she's probably drawing more of her staff from rural, from rural areas or highly urban areas. So there was the statistic in Missouri that uh, less than early, this is early on, even like when there was a lot more people eligible, but less than 3% of the African-American population had been vaccinated at this early point when they were like a large portion was eligible and should have had it, um, you know, a much, a much higher, you know, por- por- proportion. Um, and so uh, there's some vaccine hesitancy in different communities for different reasons. So yeah. uh, hopefully that declines over time. And yeah. You might get that to 50% of your staff get vaccinated. And I think um, that would be helpful. It's going to be very hard to mandate that to, to, to people. And some companies will be able to, um, but I don't know about in our industry, if that's going to be something you're going to be able to affect. Well, I was thinking about, because I would like to be able to say that all our people are vaccinated uh, just because I think it would be a boost for a lot of people, similar to what Robin is, is saying that she's having people ask if her people are vaccinated. Um, So I was thinking of offering some type of an incentive to get the uh, vaccination. Don't don't really know what, but right now I've got PPP money. So uh, my people like money too. Four hours of uh, of pay you could do, you know, and and, or or give them paid time off to go get the shot. I was gonna give them an entire day off, get a paid day off, get your shot on that day, you get paid to do it and you get the whole day's pay. So those are things that those are things that you could do that that you know would pay off. And you're you're talking about that probably cost you about 140 bucks or something like that if you're averaging Mm -hmm. like 15 to 16 bucks an hour. With you know, because you're gonna have some taxes and stuff tacked onto that. But um, you know, that's a nominal cost if you can get everyone in your, your workplace or, or nearly everyone vaccinated, I think that would be, um, it would be great. You know, 100% yeah. compliance would be ideal, but I don't know mm-hmm. that that's gonna happen. I, I would love 100%, but really I'd take 80%. Who hasn't been impacted by this last minute, right? People are like, uh-oh, I'm sick and I have to go and, uh, you know, take off for the next five days until I get the results of my test. Blah, and every blah. Time have, anytime there's an exposure and you have to quarantine and, and all that stuff. So yeah. while that's going down, I still had three exposures in the last two weeks, you know, um, mm-hmm. 
you know, where we had people we couldn't have working because we wanted to make sure that we we're again, continuing to strictly follow the rules. And um, uh, two that were feeling sick and went and got tested and were te and tested negative. Um, but still, um, can I take a chance still? Yeah, I think it's Can't just take a chance. So, but again, if they're vaccinated and they've got a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a sniffle, okay, take the day off, feel better. But you know, you, you know, you don't have COVID at that point, or it's very, very it's unlikely. unlikely. Yeah, right. very, unlikely. very unlikely. So, so it's less to worry about. Yeah, I think. Yeah, it would it would be nice. So if you can drive that number number down from two thirds to one third in the next you know next few months, and then people realize that there's not any more COVID pay for that's going away. Um, I think June first, so into the into the second quarter, all that extra uh, pay that we've been given to you know those credits we've been given to give people for for COVID exposure, for taking care of kids, for all that stuff, that's going away. So then it's just going to be down to their sick pay and their PTO and or unemployment. Or, whatever they're going to do, but or yeah. but but it's going to be. I, I don't know when they extended the federal unemployment till. I think it's till the end of June. So it's again they extended that from it was supposed to end. I thought it was September. Oh God, oh uh, I think you might be right. Um, I think September, yeah. It was supposed to end on midnight on uh, on this Sunday. The extra unemployment that's currently in effect. Um, mm -hmm. So that's so they they've extended that on for a while. Um, yeah. That, that's a whole other issue as far as as far as there's a bit of a drag on incentive to come back to work and, and things like that, depending on on how uh, stringent your state kind of, you, know, yes, right. you know, follows those procedures. So, yeah. Robin's saying the same thing as me that September he heard the same thing. So, OK, so if COVID hasn't taught us by now that we cannot read the future. <laughs> <laughs> that we need to learn that lesson. We all really thought that we were going to have all of these employees. You know, we talked about that, which is why I really like your strategy, Matt, of going from 50 to $65 and sort of jumping in front of that problem. We're not going to be having more employees right now. At least we don't want to be counting on them. So that means we need to be maximizing the amount of money that we're making from the people that we currently have. And nobody else is going to have more employees either right now. So we need to be able to, or we can charge more and we have to charge more because we don't know how long it's going to be. Well, so we're in a different position. One of the things that, you know, we I've, I've mentioned on this show before and, and talked about is, is just the investment in hiring people. So, you know, there was a time where I thought it was crazy when people had all this staff that had been with them for all these years. But now I think I'm close to out of about 29 technicians currently, I'd say I know I have at least 18 that have been with us for a year or more. And I know that at least two more have anniversaries this month. So 20 out of 29 uh, at least wow. have been with us for a year or more. Um, yeah. And obviously all of our management. Um, so that's a lot during COVID. Yeah. So again, it's a lot, it's a lot less expensive to hire when you only need to hire to grow, you know, What's the old adage? You got to hire four to keep one, basically, in this industry. Yeah, yeah, you know, forty-one. That's that's uh, that's a tired statistic. And if you can if you can uh, find ways to to cut that number down on the front end by doing a better job hiring and and mm -hmm. get it down to you know um, let's say seventy-five percent of everyone you hire makes it thirty days. If you can get that to that number, right? And yeah. let's say. Let's say that thirty or forty percent of everyone you hire lasts a year, right? Yeah, that would be that would be crazy. So I will tell you this: um, this was our lowest number of W twos uh, of our entire company history. So we we had close nice. to nice. Yeah, we had close to fifty employees when this all started, uh, but we only had seventy five W twos this year, um, and we had uh, like one hundred and fifty nine the year before. So wow. you know, obviously, COVID had some part in that. But a lot of it was we'd already started this process of really tightening up our, our hiring. And again, you can pay people more when you hire better people because they'll stay longer. They'll produce more. Um, they'll yeah, do better work. They'll do better work and you can charge yeah. more for it. I think I think mm -hmm. we've all been in this like this nightmare death spiral of like, oh, we can't pay more because people won't pay more. But honestly, I mean, you're talking about you don't think someone will pay $20 more to not have someone that looks like that 
like that looks like they know what they're doing. They show up in, you know, they show up in uniform. They look professional. They act professional. They are consistent. They do, the, they do the same job every time. You don't think someone would pay you $20 more for that versus uh, I have a temp agency that works down the street from me that they strictly hire temps with that are ex-cons and stuff like that. I mean, that's, that's all that's going to be left for the $11 an hour jobs for commer- for some of the commercial work. I had one of my commercial jobs that pays us like $10,000 a month, kind of putting some pressure on us about, about our hourly rate. And I was just like, I told him, I was like, look, you go out and you try and you try and hire a $15 an hour employee right now. And you come back and talk to me about this. I'm not that worried about losing you right now. I want to keep your business, but I can easily, I can easily tell you that the, the days of finding commercial jobs where someone comes in and bids this at $11 an hour and you're happy with who shows up in the door, you know, where they're paying their employees $11 an hour and undercutting us on wages. And we, we did this in a nicer way than that. We talked yeah. about the reality yeah. of what's going on in the marketplace and, and, you know, I was like, look, I can probably put some cheaper people on here, but they're not going to be as good. And I, and I don't really want to be happy. I don't want to put my name on it, but I can't keep Precious down here. I can't keep James down here. I can't keep, you know, all these great people that are down on this property um, if that's the case, because they've got to make more. Um, yeah. you know, they're to, too good to make that, that much money. They deserve honestly, more for what they're doing. I've wanted to, so to, to be honest, I actually kind of want to do move away. I do want to move away from some of the commercial work we do because it is, I, I, there's too much downward pressure on wages and I could find more work for those people making more money for the company long-term um, than some of the commercial work where, you know, where we're only billing out at, you know, $27 an hour, which seems crazy to me. Um, and even And even though you are so much more efficient in your time, with commercial works, you can charge less. Um, it still needs to be. It still needs to be closer to like forty, thirty-five to forty dollars an hour. And they're not prepared. Most of those places are not prepared. Right. Those big a jumps up. Mm-hmm. They There's would it. rather pay less and have, especially for your commercial and janitorial that's being done at night when no one's in the office. They're much less sensitive to how people look. I think that what they're going to also have to really consider is is bringing the work in, in house and managing the chaos of hiring and training their own people if they're going to be very price t- conscious yeah. because they can control the cost more but they're going to have to deal with the turnover but you know if they're if they're willing to pay us thirty dollars an hour if they're if, if that's what it would cost then they can hire somebody at twenty two dollars an hour with taxes and everything else and that would be a very attractive I think that would be a very attractive pay I just don't think that's where they where they want to put their energy is in hiring and training and doing all that right, stuff. Right. It, is, um, that it would be it would be a whole new business for them to get into, and they they typically don't want that piece of it. So um, yeah, it's a different job. Then they're they're all of a sudden in a different business. Uh, that, Linda, answer to your question. I personally would um, pay both sides. I would pay one on one and one on the other versus two day of and day after on the second one, even though I understand that the second vaccination tends to cause people a little bit more trouble. Oh, Robin wants to know about ERTC updates, Matt. What's, what's ERTC? Is that the tax credit? ERC? Yeah. The, uh, the employee retention credits. Um, so, uh, ERC is was was expanded under uh, the the stimulus prior to this, which allowed us that that took PPP the first time to also take these credits if we were eligible, um, and and um, the rules uh, were there were these financial tests and then there was these government order tests. So originally, you know, you had to have a decline in business of 50%. Well, I meet that test for quarter two of or whatever. But a lot of a lot of people are under the belief and a lot of the tech companies that I, the company that I'm using for, for processing my tax credit is called Synergy. But there's a, a ton of these companies that do this. And you can see if your payroll provider has one that's tied in where they'll take a, a portion of the fee to, to manage this for you to do all the they'll, – they'll basically take um, – They'll, they'll actually take legal responsibility uh, for making sure that you're eligible. Um, now you would have to give the money back if they're wrong, but they would have to pay the penalties. Right. So um, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll take on legal responsibility for determining your eligibility. And one of the things that is actually interesting is, is that even if you were never forced to close government orders affected your business, they affected your business, okay. your, your ability to hold meetings. 
uh, to have in-person staffing. So you could no longer have uh, more than, at one point you could have no longer have more than five people in a building in, in my area. So we had to shift our model to this the, the solo model, all these different things that we had to do. Your cars. Uh, school uh, closures, well, school yeah. closures has been a big deal. If you're in a major metropolitan area, there's a good chance your schools are just getting back open now. Would that be accurate where you're at or have they been open for the for Nope, the, ours, are, ours just opened two weeks ago. Yeah, so so school closures. Uh, and they're not open full time. Ours yeah. aren't open full time yet. Yeah. So those are all considered government orders that could have affected your for your business. And so, um, so Gusto does your payroll, Dana uh, or Danit. Uh, so I would ask Gusto if they're if they're helping uh, with with uh, last year uh, to to refile your nine forty ones. So what you have to do is you have to first determine your eligibility through either government order test or through tests of of declines in revenue. Um, so, so government orders is actually easier to hit than, than declines in revenue for a lot of us. So a lot of us are actually eligible for the ERC credits and didn't really realize it. Um, I didn't so, until Tom. Yeah. So, so if you are, if you are, you know, forced to shut down for any period of time, that's a government order that, that applies to a lot of us. If you had school closures or if there's limits on gatherings, if there's, all these different things can qualify. Okay. So yeah. um, now if you're in Iowa where they didn't do any statewide orders, okay, look to your local orders. See if there's local orders that apply to you. Um, if you're in some town where they didn't do any local orders, nothing ever changed, well, then probably you're out of luck. But if there's any population density where you're at, typically there's some sort of government order that you would might want to look into. Um, I'm a big fan of negotiating with these companies that are, that are managing these things. Uh, because they take on, um, they take, what is it called? Uh, their, uh, the legal status that they take for you is a power of attorney, POA. So they, they, they take power of attorney to do this. And, and with that power of attorney, they, they guarantee that, that you're in compliance. And so what I'm going to do is I've already got my, my numbers back for last year. It's significant. It's, it's actually bigger than around the PPP uh, for 2020. Nice. It is, it is a significant amount of money. Um, there's no restrictions on it, although it is taxable. So um, I'm going to take the money, set aside 25 to 30% for taxes, and then set the rest aside uh, to do something with uh, that is fairly low risk, which would be potentially hold it for a year uh, or pay off my house or do something else with that money uh, that I can get it back if the government says back. Alicia, you there? Uh, you're cutting in and out it. just a little bit. Okay, so I was I was kind of saying, you know, just doing something low risk. Like I would I wouldn't put it into anything you couldn't get back out, or there might be some potential loss in case there's ever a clawback on on this. Um, but I, I I feel like if you if you go through one of these companies and you're eligible, the chances of that happening are, are very low. Um, if you do it yourself and you're you're not clear. Um, there is there, there is some complication to this. I mean, the packet that we put together, kind of proving our, our eligibility, was was fairly significant. Um, you know, and the calculations are tricky too because you want to try and maximize your your weeks of eligibility. So you want to minimize the amount of weeks of PPP forgiveness you had in right. 2020. Uh, and when they changed the rules from either having to take an eight or a 24 week forgiveness period, I narrowed mine down to as short a week as I as short a week. Uh, forgiveness period like. and got it down to 11 weeks. Um, so that that means that I had a lot more weeks eligible for ERC. ERC, right. Yeah. Um, okay. For last year, that was about 5,000 per employee uh, was what you could, is what you could get. And um, nice. if you had a lot of turnover, that might've worked in your benefit because <laughs> even, uh, even better. <laughs> perhaps. Because you, you, you know, you max out a lot of people at some point. So if you had, a, if you had a lot of turnover, it might've worked out in your benefit. Well, and I, I know that a lot of people did have a lot of turnover just because um, a lot of people in our industry have parents with kids and all of a sudden the kids weren't in school and parents had to stay home. So I ran into that a lot. We, we did get a lot of them back after uh, the monies kind of ran out, especially that 600 additional federal 
money per week. Um, but it, it's still still a bit of a challenge. And our even our daycare stayed closed for a really long time. So it's hard to get people back to work when, you know, they're, they just don't have anybody to watch their kids. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I would be very conservative with, with this money when it comes in. And again, um, you know. You tend to be a more conservative person with your money anyway, Matt. You're you're not a flying yeah, high and I'm loose. Not, I'm not going to buy a Tesla. I mean, you know, um, so we were we were buying a house last year and um, we were buying a house last year and uh, we were approved for some obscene amount of money. And we ended up spending like under half of what they approved us for because just just because the bank says you can get a mortgage for that just didn't make sense for us to, to go there. So, yeah, very, very much so don't really feel like you have to, you know, live. I don't know. I think there's some expectations of how much, you know, how much house you're supposed to have, like signs of success, different cars, things like that. The only person that the person that, that matters to is you. And, uh, you know, all those things in the end, um, we want to enjoy our lives, make enough money to, to be able to, to, to be successful. But, um, you know, my, my goal is to be, to be able to have enough money in the bank that I'm generating a, a reasonable income uh, in the next 10 years that I don't have to work if I don't want to. So you can't do that if you're spending every dollar that comes in, you know, right. so that's, that's my eventual goal. Yeah, so that that's definitely how we have always looked at our money is we're comfortable. We don't really need more. So Tim and I have really never had like brand new cars. We almost always buy like at least a two-year-old car, three-year-old car. They're like new to us when we get them. Yeah. Now, every once in a while, Tim does have a little bit of a, he's got a little bit of a car obsession. So sometimes, you know, he has had some very nice cars. You know, I, I think everybody's heard about his Ferrari and he's got a 68 Camaro and he's got, you know, so he does get a, a, a few nice cars here those and again. Cars, those are already depreciated in the sense that they're whatever. If there was depreciation, that's already off them. And then now their collectability yep. makes them more valuable in the yep. sense, you know, that they're uh, that they're rare, that they're a rare commodity. So. It's not like it's not like going out and buying a brand new Tesla and, and right. you know I could make a I could make a a a rationale for buying a Tesla and I and I may buy something like that like an electric car in the next couple of years mm -hmm. uh, mostly because you know I am investing in solar in my house and in the next few years electric cars plugged into your house could actually be the backup battery so when that situation happened in Texas your car would power your house because the battery banks are so big on those things. Yeah. You could power your house for wow. day. So the solar would charge your car during the, during the day and the, and then the batteries from your car would power your house at night. Um, or like a generator. It would. Yeah. I mean, yeah. basically. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I can make the, uh, the, the, I think the leap is going to happen that we're going to be probably all buying cars similar to Tesla's in the next few years. That's where the, the te technology is going. My point is, you don't have to have the, the highest brand name, fanciest things and, right. still be, and still be enjoying things. So like, you know, we, we did, you know, but also, I also am never afraid to, you know, do some things that are a little, that are a little out there. If I think I can get a return on the purchase, if I buy an RV and, you know, want to enjoy it, I'll, I'll buy a 10 year old, you know, use, you know, class A RV and drive it for two years and then sell it for almost what I paid for it. Um, you know, you're going to, you're going to spend some money on that, but, um, you know, buying stuff, it's just different choices, but I don't want to, you know, if somebody likes to buy new cars, buy new cars. If you're making the money yeah. with it, I, I just suggest having a strategy that's going to allow you to not have to work your whole life. And so that's my, that's my thinking on, on money typically is, um, you know, nice nest egg, nice, you know, be prepared for, for a rainy day. And just cause you're making $300,000 this year does not mean you're going to make that forever. You could, you could decline by 50% and be able to be able to live, on on less than what you're making now because as entrepreneurs we don't have total control over all the things that have made us successful up to this point we like to think we do um yeah. some of it's amazing being at the right place at the right time though too it's you know we we're not doing the most original thing here we're cleaning houses so some of it is some of it is right time right place some of it is we've built we've built a better mousetrap um we've done it better than our competitors it's not i don't want to take away anything from anyone you guys are doing awesome um 
but the market could change. It, it, it has in years past. Well, and, and that's my point right now, just because the numbers are going down and most people are thinking, yay, COVID's behind us now. It's going to be something we don't have to worry about. Sure. We we just don't know. We just, I, I mean, maybe, maybe you guys are really, really confident. I'm less confident because I've been wrong <laughs> quite a few times throughout this past year about what I thought was going to happen. So I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit more conservative just because I, I don't have the confidence that I know exactly where things are going to be at the end of 2021. And I don't know what the government's going to do. I mean, they're printing money like, like a, they, you know, like, how's that all going to play out? I, this is like Tom likes to say, this is unprecedented. I think there's is, some some things that are long term potentially. They're they're testing out like almost universal income with uh, with these child tax credits and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to pump a lot of money back into the economy. The average family is going to have um, several thousand dollars more a year a year if they were to, if they were extend this tax credit for three thousand dollars per child permanently. Um, you know, average family has two and a half children, you know, for not every house has kids. I don't know how that works exactly, but you know, households that do have children under a certain age, I mean, that, that gives you the ability to, you know, to spend more on your kids, put them in activities, better education. It's going to pump a lot of money to the economy. Um, good or bad. I don't know if we can afford it, you know, tax wise, but I think we spend plenty of money on other things that I think you could, you could make the, the case that, that it pays, it pays for itself and it's good for the economy long term, but uh, it's definitely an experiment. We're going to see how this all plays out over the next couple of years as to how how this money really does flow back into the economy. How it uh, if some of these investments they're making now really do help us recover quicker. Uh, if more if more money in people's pockets does pay back in the you know into the economy, I think it will. And things go in cycles. So it looks like the cycle is coming again where only one person works outside of the home. We have been on a two person outside of the home cycle for a while. And it looks like we're getting back to, because if we have enough money coming into a household, why would you have both people working outside of the home? I still don't see that as likely. I think it takes about $67,000, what I've heard, to live in most places to have a middle-class lifestyle for a family um, minimum. That's minimum. So but if nobody's working, Matt, yeah. guess what happens? People get paid more. If yeah. only half of the amount of people are working. Right now, we're, we're beginning to recognize that how fast are you having to raise wages? Sure. We're Raising wages, raising, raising wages, raising wages. And we are the lowest paid segment of the market. If we're having to raise, 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 it's hard for me to believe that everybody isn't. No, but I think you're, I think you're right. I think that that's, you see those cycles. That's the, there's some truth to that. I, I don't see that. I don't see us getting away from two income families for a while, but it could, it could. Yeah. I don't um, see it coming. Like I don't see it in 2021, but the trend is definitely going that way. People are getting more used to being home. People don't want to go back to work. They've been at home. They're, it's, it's a new thing. And, and for sure, there are going to be fewer people that are outside of their home working. That's that's new. That's well, not going as back. Trends, as far as trends that I think our people, our, our companies, you know, need to look out for, I think is, is uh, you know, where do they fit into where do they fit into that as far as how do they how do they service people when they're home more and how do, how do we you know how do we work around people more that you know oh, lose me how do we work around oh, keep do i keep dropping this sorry i'm sure what's going well, on just internet. just your visual your audio is is staying pretty okay. pretty good so, yeah just the, the thought being that you know we do have to continue to to adapt our service for this new world that we're in and and look at you know, look at how we best service people. Um, okay, you know, Matt, we only have one more minute and I, ha I do have a question that I wanted to ask you. Oh shoot, we're out of time. All right, we'll see if you can answer this really quick because I'm supposed to wrap it up. Uh, right now, we thought that uh, commercial properties were really going to open up. That was another thing that you're gonna be able to get commercial property really cheap, but it's not. What are you, what are you thinking about people having offices and moving away from offices, um, investing in an office? You got anything for us there? Um, I never think commercial properties are good investments personally, but that's, 
that's my opinion. Unless you're to buy something, you have multiple tenants renting from you. It's to me, I don't, I think it's a vanity purchase. Um, you want to have your office exactly how you want it. Um, and you're, you're counting on appreciation uh, versus cash flow. I like business. I like businesses that cash flow and pay for themselves. And I don't see commercial property as, as that kind of investment. Um, you are, you are locking in and controlling your, your cost, but oftentimes at a much higher price than you can for, for rent right now. Um, did you buy your building at, at, at some nope. point? Yeah. No, we don't. I, I do know two people that are right now looking at uh, purchasing uh, their buildings. That's why. And I told them that I would, you I'd ask. if you can lock in your costs and you, you know, you know that, you know, you've got, you know, a long-term business, you've been in for a while. It's, it's, you know, it's good. I mean, I like, I, I, I worked in an industry in the airline industry where I worked for a subcontractor called Republic Airways where we just, we the short, I want to kind of keep, keep this brief was, but I, I always kind of looked at it as like, if they just turned that, turned in all the airplanes tomorrow, cut their leases, no one would ever know they existed. It was like, it was all leased. It was like, and, and, and it's, and the reason I say that it is, is that it's a lot easier to un unwind your business if you have to, right? If yeah. you have a lot of commercial properties that you need to sell, everything that you have to sell at the end and all that stuff, that makes it more technical. Now, some people say having a, having a property makes the business easier to sell and things like that, a location. I don't know. That makes sense when you have like a retail business or something like that where location, location is so critical to uh, customer flow and things like that. But for for our businesses, it's, it's hard to justify. Now, if you could buy a strip mall where you have multiple tenants in there, and they're location dependent and they get tied into that, like, you know, hey, mm -hmm. this Mexican restaurant is this this here and they, they have their clientele that's in the neighborhood. That's great. And they're in your strip mall. That makes sense to me. But if you buy like a standalone building for your business, um, I see that more of a as a I want to have this this place be ours and be customized. Right. And potentially there might be some marketing at play if you can be on a busy corner. But I'm not a I'm not a fan of standalone commercial businesses as far as investments. I don't think they. All right, I'm taking that. I'm taking that back to everybody. All right, we're running late. We're three minutes over. Sorry, Tom. We tried really hard. We had a lot to talk about today. Thanks, you guys. Tomorrow we're going to have Paul Freed and Rochelle Wilkinson on talking about uh, new markets and how you can leverage some new ideas. Talk to you guys later. Bye.